Hello Year 7. Welcome to week 6 and lesson 16 of Coraline. Well, how the pictures have changed. Isn't she looking a little bit frightening on here? But she's got a very special message for you. Remember to hand in your work. You don't want to be at the wrath of Coraline's other mother for not handing in your work on the last week of this half term. OK, there's your reminders in case you need them. But I'm sure you don't by now. Some fabulous work so far. Don't let things slip in the last week. OK, you're doing really, really well. And we're all very, very proud of you in the English department. OK, so what have we got in store for you today? This lesson is actually um, two lessons. It is lesson 16 and 17 because it's quite long. So what I want you to do for this lesson is to make sure you are just watching it for your lesson's worth and pausing it and stopping it at the end of your 45 minutes. And then for your next lesson, pick it up where you got to. OK, it's quite long. It's a long chapter. And rather than split it up into two videos, I've just done one video for two lessons. OK, so it's up to you, however you work. But if you're in school and you're following your timetable, look where you get up to on the time and then pick it up on your next lesson. OK, I know some of you got four lessons this week. Some of you have got three. Um, but there's a little quiz that is not a full lesson's worth. So the timing should work OK. All right. So it's a little bit of a longer video. You work your timings out. OK, I'm sure you can manage. Right. Let's go. So what did we do last week? We read chapter six. Then we looked at fairy tale heroes and we're going to carry on looking at our fairy tale hero this lesson. We looked at Coraline's journey and the word perilous and how things were getting perilous and dangerous for her. We looked at how the other mother is starting to change. And then we read chapter seven, where she went in through the mirror and the portal to the other world. OK, so what we're going to look at this week, we're going to look at chapter eight. It's quite a big, pivotal chapter. Things start to change. Coraline goes into battle. Then when we've looked at this chapter eight, we're going to, well, I have done you a little quiz on Microsoft Forms. So one of your assignments on Teams, there's going to be a link to a quiz on Coraline, mostly multiple choice, um, slightly different questions. It's all going to be self-marking. Um, you will get your um, results right at the end. And it's a bit of fun. It's nothing too serious just to see what you can remember. Um, so your teacher will set that on Microsoft uh, assignments, on Teams assignments. You need to check the link Follow that and uh, it's a nice little quiz for you to do on what we've done so far on Coraline. OK, um, and then, of course, your last lesson is your private reading lesson. Don't forget to check out the reading tab on the English website. There are some links to some books on there in case you've run out at home. OK, right, let's move on then. Oh, don't forget to enjoy half term. Forgot that bit. You've got a week and a day off. Get some rest. You've worked very hard and we're very proud of you. And we will see you here on this channel, YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe <laughs> after half term. OK. OK, a few little reminders from your teachers for your work. Um, so I've had a few feedback comments uh, from Mrs. Pearman and Mrs. Kears. Um, make sure that you listen to my instructions carefully. Some of you are missing out some of the tasks. Um, let's have some nice, neat work. Some of your work is beautiful, but some of you are rushing a little bit. Um, so let's have, make sure you're writing in a pen and your titles are underlined with a ruler, full stops, capital letters, um, as you would write in the classroom. Make sure you're completing all the tasks. Don't skip anything in the video. And of course, work hard and upload your work. OK, so first thing I want you to do is to come, well, draw this table. OK, pause the video and make sure you draw it carefully, either on Word or in your exercise book with a ruler. We're just putting words in there. The battle column will have maybe a sentence in there. So you need to have room to write a sentence. OK, so I want you to pause the video and carefully and neatly produce this table. OK, so now you have produced this table. And you've written in the story names. I want us to think.
think about what battles heroes go into. We've got these four stories before we look at Coraline and we've looked at these heroes before. All right. So first of all, a little recap. Who are the heroes in these stories? If you don't want a clue and you don't want a picture, pause the video now and write the character's name in the second column. If you want a clue and you want a picture, here we go. Some of them you shouldn't really need a clue for because the names are in the title of the story. OK, so off you go and write the, the characters names and the answers are coming up in three, two, one. There we go. Katniss Everdeen, Perseus, Dorothy Gale and Harry Potter. Shouldn't have really taxed you too much, shouldn't that year seven? Right now, next one, their enemy. Who do they battle with in their story? If you want to do it without a clue, pause the video now. If you need a clue about their enemy, there is a clue coming up in three, two, one. OK, so I write the enemy name in the box. Pause the video to do that if you need the time. And the answers are coming up in three, two, one. There we go. President Snow. Medusa, of course. That one shouldn't have tasked you too much. Wilhelmina the witch. You might have just put the witch. That's absolutely fine. And then, of course, Voldemort. You may have put the one who may not shouldn't be named or something like that. Absolutely. OK, well done. Right now, the battle. I don't have any clues for this. No pictures. So what is the battle that they go into? Can you explain what Katniss, Perseus, Dorothy and Harry all battle in their story? So pause the video, write a sentence if you can in those boxes and then press play when you're ready to move on. OK, yes, Evan. So what are our heroes battles? The answers are coming up in three two, one. There we go. So Katniss has to go into a, a public arena and fight to the death arranged by the capital. President Snow is, of course, the leader of the capital. Perseus has to go and chop off Medusa's head and bring it back to Polydectes, I think, as a gift. Uh, Dorothy has to defeat the evil witch. Pretty simple there. And of course, in the Philosopher's Stone, the Philosopher's Stone has uh, magic powers. So a bit of a link to Coraline there. And Lord Voldemort wants to steal it uh, because it will bring him back to life. And Harry has to defeat him so that he doesn't steal the stone. OK, well done if you got all those. So now we're going to have a look at our hero, her enemy and the battle that she goes into. Chapter 8. The other mother looked healthier than before. There was little blush to her cheeks and her hair was wriggling like lazy snakes on a warm day. Her black button eyes seemed as if they had been freshly polished. She had pushed through the mirror as if she were walking through nothing more solid than water and had stared down at Coraline. Then she opened the door with a little silver key. She picked Coraline up just as Coraline's real mother had when Coraline was much younger, cradling the half-sleeping child as if she were a baby. The other mother carried Coraline into the kitchen and put her down very gently upon the countertop. Coraline struggled to wake herself up, conscious only for the moment of having been cuddled and... loved and wanting more of it then realising where she was and who she was with. There, my sweet Coraline, said her other mother. I came and fetched you out of the cupboard. You needed to be taught a lesson, but we temper our justice with mercy here. We love the sinner and we hate the sin. Now, if you will be a good child who loves her mother, be compliant and fair spoken, you and I shall understand each other perfectly and we shall love each other perfectly as well. 
Coraline scratched the sleep grit from her eyes. There were other children in there, she said. Old ones, from a long time ago. Were there? said the other mother. She was bustling between the pans and the fridge, bringing out eggs and cheeses, butter and a slab of sliced pink bacon. Yes, said Coraline, there were. I think you're planning to turn me into one of them, a dead shell. Her mother smiled gently. With one hand, she cracked the eggs into a bowl. With the other, she whisked them and whirled them. Then she dropped a pat of butter into a frying pan where it hissed and fizzled and spun as she sliced thin slices of cheese. She poured the melted butter and the cheese into the egg mixture and whisked it some more. Now, I think you're being silly, dear, said the other mother. I love you. I will always love you. Nobody sensible believes in ghosts anyway. That's because they're all such liars. Smell the lovely breakfast I'm making for you. She poured the yellow mixture into the pan. Cheese omelette, your favourite. Coraline's mouth watered. You like games, she said. That's what I've been told. The other mother's black eyes flashed. Everybody likes games, was all she said. Yes, said Coraline. She climbed down from the counter and sat at the kitchen table. The bacon was sizzling and spitting under the grill. It smelled wonderful. Wouldn't you be happier if you won me, fair and square? asked Coraline. Possibly, said the other mother. She had a show of unconcernedness, but her fingers twitched and drummed and she licked her lips with her scarlet tongue. What exactly are you offering? Me, said Coraline, and she gripped her knees under the table to stop them from shaking. If I lose, I'll stay here with you forever and I'll let you love me. I'll be a most dutiful daughter. I'll eat your food and play happy families. And I'll let you sew your buttons into my eyes. Her other mother stared at her. Black buttons. Unblinking. That sounds very fine, she said. And if you do not lose, then you let me go. You let everyone go. My real father and mother, the dead children, everyone you've trapped here. The other mother took the bacon from under the grill and put it on a plate. Then she slipped the cheese omelette from the pan onto the plate, flipping it as she did so, letting it fold itself into a perfect omelette shape. She placed the breakfast plate in front of Coraline, along with a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice and a mug of frothy hot chocolate. Yes, she said. I think I like this game, but what kind of game shall it be? A riddle game? A test of knowledge or of skill? An exploring game, suggested Coraline. A finding things game. Hmm. What is it you think you should be finding in this hide and go seek game, Coraline Jones? Coraline hesitated then. My parents, said Coraline, and the souls of the children behind the mirror. The other mother smiled at this triumphantly, and Caroline wondered if she had made the right choice. Still, it was too late to change her mind now. Hmm, a deal, said the other mother. Now eat up your breakfast, my sweet. Don't worry, it won't hurt you. Caroline stared at the breakfast, hating herself for giving in so easily, but she was starving. How do I know you'll keep your word? asked Caroline. I swear it said the other mother. I swear it on my own mother's grave. Does she have a grave? asked Coraline. <laughs> oh yes, said the other mother. I put her in there myself. And when I find her trying to crawl out, I put her back. I swear on something else, so I can trust you to keep your word. <clears throat> my right hand, said the other mother, holding it up. She waggled the long fingers slowly, displaying the claw-like nails. I swear on that. Coraline shrugged. OK, she said. It's a deal. She ate the breakfast, trying not to wolf it down. She was hungrier than she had thought. As she ate, the other mother stared at her. It was hard to read expressions into those black button eyes, but Coraline thought that the other mother looked hungry too. She drank the orange juice 
but even though she knew she would like it, she could not bring herself to taste the hot chocolate. Mm -mm -mm. Right, so this is your title for today's work. The question, how does Neil Gaiman show us that Coraline is preparing for battle? And there are three questions I want you to try and answer. But I also want you to try and develop your answers as much as possible, Year 7. I want you to include full sentences. I want capital letter and full stop. And if you can, your challenge is to try and include any short embedded quotation words. You don't have to, but if you can, see if you can include any words from the text in any of your answers. So the first question is, how is the other mother described and why is she like this? So you might need to go back in the video and have a look at the first page of the bit that we've just read. How is the other mother described? Why do you think Neil Gaiman has described her like this, just as Coraline's about to go into battle? OK, so there's two bits to the question. The first bit is probably quite easy. How is the other mother described? And then why is she like this? Okay, and the second question is, what does Coraline tell the other mother and why does she do this? So you need to look for what information Coraline tells the other mother and then think, hmm, before she's going into battle, why does she tell her that? So there's two bits to the question. One's a little bit easy. What does she tell her? And the more difficult bit to the question why does she tell her to do this? And then number three, what sort of challenge does she give her? OK, not as much of a difficult question at the bottom. OK, there's no why bit for that. So I want you to pause the video and I want you to try and answer those questions in as much detail as possible. And your challenge is to try and embed any quotations in there. OK, so pause the video, go back to the text if you need to and press play when you're ready to move on. OK, so let's have a look at what we've got for question number one and see if you want to compare your answers to mine and make any improvements. So number one, the other mother is described as looking very healthy. Her cheeks have a blush and her hair was wriggling like snakes. She gets more like Medusa as we go along, doesn't she? She's actually got hair that's wriggling like snakes now. Her eyes are also very shiny. So why might that be? Why is she suddenly getting healthier? Well, this makes me think she's getting ready to be as strong as possible to defeat Coraline. It's like she she knows she's going into battle so she's getting herself beefed up and ready to get into battle she thinks i need to be as fit as possible to defeat and to win Coraline. okay question number two what does Coraline tell the other mother and why does she do this well Coraline tells the other mother she knows about her plan she says, I know what you're doing. Why does she do this? She does this because it might make Coraline feel more powerful. If the other mother thinks Coraline knows her game, it might give her an advantage. So Coraline's trying to make herself feel stronger. Even though she's just a little girl, she's trying to tell the other mother, well, I know what you're up to. She's trying to make herself look stronger. Okay. So what sort of challenge does Coraline give her? Gives her a big challenge. With a big prize, she can't resist wanting to win. You may have put something about hide and seek, wanting to find something, something about her parents and the souls. It's something she can't resist. OK, she can't say no to it. If you remember what the cat said, she loves games. She loves a challenge. 
Okay, well done, Year 7. And well done if you managed to get any quotations in there. Good job. Right, just before we move on and we look at the rest of the chapter then, there's three key vocabulary words I want us to look at. All right, so I want you to write these three key vocabulary words down and I want you to see if you know what they mean. If you don't, you could look them up. You could ask someone in your house, what do these three words mean? Because they come up in the rest of the chapter. So we've got anti-room, derelict and ghastly. Not ghostly, it's ghastly. OK, so write those down underneath your answers to the question. And do you know what those words mean? Pause the video, see if you can find out, and then we'll have a look at the definitions. OK, so what do these words mean? What's an anteroom? OK, well, an ante means before. If you have ante before something, it means before. So it's a room that's used for holding something like a waiting room. Derelict, you might have heard of. Something in a very poor condition as a result of not being used or neglected. So if you don't live in a house, if it's just left, it often gets very derelict. And ghastly is something that causes great horror or fear. So watch out for those words coming up in the chapter. OK, now you know what they mean. OK, so let's have a look at the rest of chapter eight. And don't forget to watch out for your timings and make sure that you use this video for two lessons, okay? Where should I start looking? Asked Caroline. Where you wish, said her other mother, as if she did not care at all. Caroline looked at her. Caroline thought hard. There was no point, she decided, in exploring the garden and the grounds they didn't exist. They weren't real. There was no abandoned tennis court in the other mother's world, no bottomless well. All that was real was a house itself. She looked around the kitchen. She opened the oven, peered into the freezer, poked into the salad compartment of the fridge. The other mother followed her about, looking at Coraline with a smirk, always hovering at the edge of her lips. How big are the soles anyway? asked Coraline. The other mother sat down at the kitchen table and leaned back against the wall, saying nothing. She picked at her teeth with a long, crimson, varnished fingernail. Then she tapped the finger gently, tap, 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 against the polished black surface of her black button eyes. Fine, said Coraline. Don't tell me. I don't care. It doesn't matter if you help me or not. Everyone knows that a soul is the same size as a beach ball. She was hoping. The other mother would say something like, <laughs> nonsense, the size of ripe onions or suitcases or grandfather clocks. But the other mother simply smiled and the tap, tap, tapping of her fingernails against her eyes was as steady and relentless as a drip of water droplets from the tap into the sink. And then Caroline realised it was simply the noise of the water and she was alone in the room. Caroline shivered. She preferred the other mother to have a location. If she were nowhere, then she could be anywhere. And after all, it is always easy to be afraid of something you cannot see. She put her hands into her pockets and her fingers closed around the reassuring shape of the stone with the hole in it. She pulled it out of her pocket, held it in front of her as if she were holding a gun and walked out into the hall. There was no sound but the tap of the water dripping into the metal sink. She glanced at the mirror at the end of the hall. For a moment it clouded over and it seemed to her that faces swam in the glass, indistinct and shapeless, and then the faces were gone and there was nothing in the mirror but a girl who was small for her age, holding something that glowed gently like a green coal. Caroline looked down at her hand, surprised, it was just a pebble with a hole in it, a nondescript brown stone. Then she looked back into the mirror where the stone glimmered like an emerald, a trail of green fire blew from the stone in the mirror 
and drifted towards Coraline's bedroom. Hmm, said Coraline. She walked into the bedroom. The toys fluttered excitedly as she came in, as if they were pleased to see her, and a little tank rolled out of the toy box to greet her, its treads rolling over several other toys. It fell from the toy box onto the floor, tipping as it fell, and it lay on the carpet like a beetle on its back, grumbling and grinding its treads before Coraline picked it up and turned it over. The tank fled under the bed in embarrassment. Coraline looked around the room. She looked in the cupboards and the drawers. Then she picked up one end of the toy box and tipped all the toys in it out onto the carpet, where they grumbled and stretched and wiggled awkwardly free of each other. A grey marble rolled across the floor and clicked against the wall. None of the toys looked particularly so like, she thought. She picked up and examined a silver charm bracelet from which hung tiny animal charms which chased each other around the perimeter of the bracelet. The fox never catching the rabbit, the bear never gaining on the fox. Coraline opened her hand and looked at the stone with a hole in it, hoping for a clue but not finding one. Most of the toys that had been in the toy box had now crawled away to hide under the bed and the few toys that were left a green plastic soldier, the glass marble, a vivid pink yo-yo and such were the kind of things you find in the bottoms of toy boxes in the real world, forgotten objects, abandoned and unloved. She was about to leave and look elsewhere, and then she remembered a voice in the darkness, a gentle whispering voice and what it had told her to do. She raised the stone with a hole in it, and held it in front of her right eye. She closed her left eye and looked at the room through the hole in the stone. Through the stone, the world was grey and colourless, like a pencil drawing. Everything in it was grey. No, not quite everything. Something glinted on the floor. Something the colour of an ember in nursery fireplace. The colour of a scarlet and orange tulip nodding in the May sun. Caroline reached out her left hand, scared that if she took her eye off it, it would vanish, and she fumbled for the burning thing. Her fingers closed about something smooth and cool. She snatched it up and then lowered the stone with a hole in it from her eye and looked down. The grey glass marble from the bottom of the toy box sat dully in the pink palm of her hand. She raised the stone to her eye once more and looked through it at the marble. Once again, the Marble burned and flickered with a red fire. A voice whispered in her mind, Indeed, later, it comes to me that I certainly was a boy. Now I do think on it. Oh, but you must hurry. There are two of us still to find, and the bedlam is already angry with you for uncovering me. If I'm going to do this, thought Coraline, I'm not going to do it in her clothes. She changed back into her pyjamas and her dressing gown and her slippers, leaving the grey sweater and the black jeans neatly folded up onto the bed, the orange boots on the floor by the toy box. She put the marble in her dressing gown pocket and walked out into the hall. Something stung her face and hands like sand blowing on a beach on a windy day. She covered her eyes and pushed forward. The sand stings got worse and it got harder and harder to walk, as if she were pushing into the wind on a particularly blustery day. It was a vicious wind and a cold one. She took a step backwards, the way she had come. Oh, keep going, whispered a ghost voice in her ear, for the bedlam is angry. She stepped forward, into the hallway, into another gust of wind which stung her cheeks and face with invisible sand, sharp as needles, sharp as glass. Play fair, showered Coraline into the wind. There was no reply, but the wind whipped about her one more time, petulantly, and then it dropped away and was gone. As she passed the kitchen, Coraline could hear in the sudden silence the drip, drip of the water from the leaking tap, or perhaps the other mother's long fingernails tapping impatiently against the table. Coraline resisted the urge to look. In a couple of strides, she reached the front door and she walked outside. 
Caroline went down the steps and around the house until she reached the other Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's flat. The lamps around the door were flickering on and off, almost randomly now, spelling out no words that Caroline could understand. The door was closed. She, were afraid, she was afraid it was locked, and she pushed on it with all her strength. First it stuck, and then suddenly it gave, and with a jerk, Caroline stumbled into the dark room beyond. Caroline closed one hand around the stone with a hole in it, and walked forward into the blackness. She expected to find a curtained ante-room, but there was nothing there. The room was dark. The theatre was empty. She moved ahead cautiously. Something rustled above her. She looked up into a deeper darkness, and as she did so, her feet knocked against something. She reached down, picked up a torch and clicked it on, sweeping the beam around the room. The theatre was derelict and abandoned. Chairs were broken on the floor and old dusty spider's webs draped the walls and hung from the rotten wood and the decomposing velvet hangings. Something rustled once again. Caroline directed her light beam upwards towards the ceiling. There were things up there, hairless, jellyish. She thought they might once have had faces, might even once have been dogs, but no dogs had wings like bats or could hang like spiders, like bats upside down. The light startled the creatures and one of them took to the air, its wings whirring heavily through the dust. Coraline ducked as it swooped close to her. It came to rest on a far wall and it began to clamber upside down, back to the nest of the dog bats upon the ceiling. Caroline raised the stone to her eye and she scanned the room through it, looking for something that glowed or glinted, a telltale sign that somewhere in this room was another hidden soul. She ran the beam of the torch about the room as she searched, the thick dust in the air making the light beam seem almost solid. There was something up on the back wall behind the ruined stage. It was greyish white, twice the size of Coraline herself, and it was stuck to the back wall like a slug. Coraline took a deep breath. I am not afraid, she told herself. I'm not. She did not believe herself, but she scrambled onto the old stage, fingers sinking into the rotten wood. She pulled herself up. She got closer to the thing on the wall. She saw that it was some kind of sack, like a spider's egg case. It twitched in the light beam. Inside the sack was something that looked like a person, but a person with two heads, with twice as many arms and legs as it should have. The creature in the sack seemed horribly unformed and unfinished, as if two plasticine people had been warmed and rolled together, squashed and pressed into one thing. Caroline hesitated. She did not want to approach the thing. The dog bats dropped one by one from the ceiling and began to circle the room, coming closer to her, but never touching her. Perhaps there are no souls hidden in here, she thought. Perhaps I can just leave and go somewhere else. She took a last look through the hole in the stone. The abandoned theatre was still a bleak grey, but now there was a brown glow, as rich and bright as polished cherry wood, coming from inside the sack. Whatever was glowing was being held in one of the hands of the thing on the wall. Coraline walked slowly across the damp stage, trying to make as little noise as she could, afraid that if she disturbed the thing in the sack, it would open its eyes and see her. And then, but there was nothing that she could think of that was as scary as having it look at her. Her heart pounded in her chest. She took another step forward. She'd never been so scared, but still she walked forward until she reached the sack. Then she pushed her hand into the sticky, clinging whiteness of the stuff on the wall. It crackled softly like a tiny fire. As she pushed, 
and it clung to her skin and clothes like a spider web clings, like white candy floss. She pushed her hand into it and she reached upward until she touched a cold hand, which was, she could feel, closed around another glass marble. The creature's skin felt slippery, as if it had been covered in jelly. Caroline tugged at the marble. At first nothing happened. It was held tight in the creature's grasp. Then, one by one, the fingers loosened their grip and the marble slipped into her hand. She pulled her arm back through the sticky webbing, relieved that the thing's eyes had not opened. She shone the light on its faces. They resembled, she decided, the younger versions of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible, but twisted and squeezed together like two lumps of wax that had melted and melded together into one ghastly object. Without warning, one of the creature's hands made a grab for Coraline's arm. Its fingernails scraped her skin, but it was too slippery to grip, and Coraline pulled away successfully. And then the eyes opened, four black buttons glinting and staring down at her, and two voices that sounded like no voice that Coraline had ever heard began to speak to her. One of them wailed and whispered, the other buzzed like a fat and angry blue bottle at a window pane, but the voices said as one person, Thief! Give it back! Stop! Thief! The air became alive with dog bats. Coraline began to back away. She realised then that, terrifying though the thing on the wall was, the thing that had once been the other Mrs Spink and Forcible was attached to the wall by its web, encased in its cocoon. It could not follow her. The dog bats flapped and fluttered about her, but they did nothing to hurt Coraline. She climbed down from the stage and shone the torch about the old theatre, looking for the way out. Flee, miss, wailed a girl's voice in her head. Flee now, you have two of us. Flee this place while your blood still flows. Coraline dropped the marble into her pocket beside the other. She spotted the door, ran to it, and pulled on it until it opened. Okay, so... The magic stone. I need to write that question down. And if you want to draw yourself a little picture of the stone, we're just going to finally, our final task for this lesson, to do a little brainstorm about her magic object and how that magic stone has helped Coraline so far. There are about four ideas that I want you to think of. OK, so write the question. And you can brainstorm around the question if you want, or you can just do a list underneath it. I want you to pause the video and think, can I think of four different ways the magic stone has helped Coraline? So to pause the video and do that and then press play when you're ready and see if your ideas are any similar to the ones that I've got here. Seven. OK, so what did you get? Well, first of all, did you remember that she felt much better when she touched it? She's reassured when she touches it. She feels much safer when she knows she's got the magic stone. Like it's a lucky charm. What else did you get? Well, she didn't actually know what to do with it until that voice. She remembered the voice saying, look through the stone. So she didn't know what to do until she remembered the voice. OK. Did you also remember? They looked very, very normal to her until she saw it in the mirror. Then it looked like it was glowing and it had a trail of green glow behind it. And then the main thing. Every, when she looks through it, everything is black and white, except for the souls. So it helps her identify the souls, which are brightly coloured and they glow. And everything else, when she looks through the hole in the stone, is black and white and grey. Well done if you got those. So we're now knowing how her magic item helps her on her journey. Well done, Year 7. OK, so a little reminder then. 
you will also have another assignment set on Teams with a link to a quiz. And it will look like this. And there was a number of different questions and there are 50 points available. It doesn't mean there's 50 questions, don't worry. OK, so make sure you do that and make sure you submit your answers so we can see how you've got on so far. Multiple choice and there's no long uh, answers required or anything like that. It's very straightforward. OK. And well done for all your hard work this half term. We've been very impressed and I hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll be carrying on with Coraline when we come back after half term. Enjoy your rest of year seven. Over and out.